Good afternoon, everyone. Please take your seats. Thank you very much and good afternoon. The greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. This quote is from Robert Swan. He's a British explorer and environmentalist who has uh, walked both the North and the South Pole. And we will see today that people around the world have been working tirelessly in the past 150 years to help generations prepare for the future. As we are celebrating today 150th anniversary of the International Meteorological Organization, the former WMO, we want to look back at the pioneers, but we want to look forward as well because the theme of the World Meteorological Day this year is the future of weather, climate, and water across generations. This day will be celebrated officially next week on the 23rd of March by all our members. We are celebrating it a week uh, ahead uh, of time this year because of the UN Water Conference taking place uh, next week. I'm Brigitte Perrin, I'm the head of communication at WMO, and today, we have in this room very distinguished people, Secretary General, ambassadors, professors, directors, scientists, experts. However, we will hear first from somebody who believes that mothers are the ones with the biggest power to change the world. Esra Sumeye is 14 years old. She lives in Turkey, not far from where the, the, the earthquakes hit uh, two weeks ago. Her school got even damaged. Esra is the winner of the 2022 Universal Postal Union letter competition. Kids had to write to someone influential about how to take action on climate. She will be reading some excerpts of her letter, initially written in Turkish. Esra, you have the floor. My dear mama, you know that I have frightening dreams. Well, they are all about the climate crisis. I'm afraid. Please, mama, help me to overcome this crisis together. The world that children are to inherit is disappearing with the climate crisis. Our future is slipping from our grasp. Our hopes are fading. Our dreams are polluted and our laughter is replaced by tears. I'm afraid, Mama. I'm afraid. Help me, Mama. Help me. Dearest mothers, before the climate crisis opens up irreparable wounds in our lives, you must say stop to this distraction that can cause irreversible damage. You are mothers and mothers reproduce give birth, rise, teach, educate. Mothers bring us into the world, give life. Dearest mothers, do not forget that a mother guides and influences a child, and that a child changes and strengthens society. The way of life of mothers determines the way of life of their children. Mothers guide us towards the future. For example, if a mother dries the laundry on a line rather than in a dryer, her children will follow her example and turn off the tape to avoid wasting water and switch off unnecessary light. And so small precautions prevent major catastrophes. Mother are guides with generation following in their footsteps. Dear mothers, you are the vanguard in an army of nature lovers fighting against the climate crisis. We children with you are there to the end to say stop to the global crisis, the climate crisis. We are young, we are happy, we are free. We love our world very much. We want to leave a clean and undamaged legacy for our children. Therefore, we listen to and support our mothers 
to the end. And we follow in your footsteps. We are growing up with sub love and a happy world. I salute all mothers who are fighting the climate crisis and who respect the environment. Thank you. Professor Talas, we heard that the way of life of mothers determines the way of life of their children. You are Secretary General of WMO. Do you think mothers can make the difference? For sure. And first of all, uh, I would like to say that uh, our thoughts are very much uh, with the victims of, uh, of this uh, earthquake in, in, in uh, Turkey and uh, and Syria, and and you, I'm sure that you have also suffered because of uh, of that. Uh, uh, it's uh, I think that it's a two way issue. Uh, both the mothers can uh, tell the children uh, about these uh, facts, for example, how to live uh, in a cli climate friendly way, and and we are lucky that we have uh, means to be, be be more climate friendly in our everyday life. And on the other hand, you children, you can educate the mothers. Uh, I have learned it in, in my own family that our children are very much uh, educating us how to how to be more climate friendly in our everyday everyday action. And then hopefully there will be also science oriented mothers who can t tell the policymakers and, and private sector how to how to be successful in climate uh, mitigation. And also uh, ho hopefully there are mothers and fathers uh, who are scientific experts who can also mitigate unnecessary fears related to climate uh, climate change. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, fear for end of the world uh, is not very much based on, on solid science. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so I, I would say that mothers can play a very important role, but you as children and the next generation of uh, of people on this planet, uh, you can you you will be also very important players, and you can teach us. Uh, old ones uh, in that sense. Thank you. So uh, now I will tell you uh, a few words about the past of uh, this organization. As, as you, uh, as Prithit already said, we are celebrating 150th anniversary of, uh, of WMO, IMO today. And, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, but we are also supposed to have bright future for this uh, organization and in my presentation I will touch uh, both uh, both issues and first of all I would like to thank uh, all of you for coming here and uh, and and you are making the party and I hope that you will have chance to join the uh, party afterwards in, in in our cafeteria where our our, uh, our uh, staff members have been cooking food from their home regions we have uh, uh, tables from six different regions and you can enjoy the delicacies from all over the world uh, upstairs. But uh, can I have the next slide, please? So a few words about the history. Uh, first of all, uh, we, we are grateful for a Greek philosopher Aristotle, who, who invented the term mythology, and he was, uh, he was uh, describing how the Earth system functions. Uh, we are not fully in line with his thinking anymore, but, uh, but he was the father of, uh, of meteorology. And then a couple of uh, dramatic events from the from the history. Uh, uh, these typhoons, uh, which are now nowadays becoming more and more frequent uh, in Asia, they have been also changing the world uh, history. For example, uh, the, the the Mongolian Empire tried to conquer uh, Japan twice in the in the twelfth uh, the thirteenth century, and uh, twice uh, they were hit by typhoons and uh, destroyed their their navy, and there were there were hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers who died, and that that led to gradual collapse of the whole whole Mongolian Empire. So the weather has played very important role in history, and even here in Geneva, we have there have there have been uh, dramatic things happening. We all feel that uh, we are very safe here in in Geneva, but uh, but uh, in 563 there was a. Uh, uh, Tsunami, uh, and the estimation was that it was 60 meters high, which destroyed uh, Geneva and uh, and all of the all of the inhabited areas 
around this uh, this lake. Next, please. And and then uh, 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 even the philosophers uh, understand that the issues that we are dealing with uh, they are very important. The Montesquieu was a lawyer, and he wrote his famous uh, book uh, Spirit of Law, and there he was stating that uh, climate is the first uh, world uh, power. And, and and there are of course uh, dramatic th things that have happened uh, uh, because of weather. Uh, we have had famine uh, here in Europe, but of nowadays more more in less developed part of the world. And, and that was demonstrating that there's a need for agricultural services and, and better uh, climate uh, know-how. For example, in my home country in Finland, uh, in the uh, nine, uh, 1690s, uh, one third of the population died of, uh, of hunger. And that was related to very harsh uh, climatic uh, conditions. And weather has also played a very important role in, in various wars like the Napoleon war uh, in Russia and also also during the Second World War. Next, please. And IMO was established in 1873, as was already said, and, and, and the, the first uh, uh, idea of such, such an organization was uh, invented by two Navy officers, uh, Mr. Maury and uh, Janssen, and they organized in 1853 a Congress to set standards for the marine meteorology, both the services and uh, and, and observations and, and 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 this transport sector was uh, was one of the key customers of uh, of such services and then we had this uh, 1873 third international meteorological congress when imo was established and uh, here you can see the second one in in rome and if you look at uh, those pictures carefully there's not a single female one in in either of those those pictures but in 51, when the first uh, World Meteorological Congress was organized in Paris, there were already a few ladies available. But if you look at the uh, WMO Secretariat, uh, which is the first, uh, with first uh, Secretary Svoboda, you can see that he was the only male one, and the rest of the Secretariat was, uh, was just females. And they were first in the built, and, and they moved to Geneva in 1951, when the Swiss government was providing more fancy fancy premises. Next piece. And now we are very fancy premises here. Thanks to, <laughs> thanks to you, Jürg. And nowadays we are happy to have this uh, organization and, um, and, and we are the second oldest United Nations agency. International Telecommunication Union is, uh, is a bit older than us and, and we are very much uh, working together with, uh, with uh, members and, and we are special, special because we are dealing with concrete issues. We, have, we are less uh, this kind of blah, blah, organization and we are more action oriented and we have created a global observing system and uh, you can regard us as uh, grandfathers of uh, of big uh, big data and we have also invented uh, ipcc uh, which is actually publishing its most recent report the next uh, next monday in in Clothen. and also in the un we are we are contributing uh, to, the, to the science uh, science of UN and, and also this preparation of the forthcoming COP meetings. And we are grateful that uh, that ambassador from United Arab Emirates is here with us. Uh, I was on Monday in Abu Dhabi to discuss uh, the, the agenda of uh, COP28. And we are happy to have also the, uh, the, the presidency of uh, COP27 from Egypt uh, present here today. Next, please. And, and, and then our friends in World Economic Forum, which we also have present presence today, uh, actually on, on that side, uh, uh, they, they are writing annually a report, which are the biggest risks for the global economy in 10 years. And, uh, and this year, they also estimated what's, what, which are the biggest risks in two years uh, time scale. But if you look at this 10 years scale, it's very much uh, climate uh, failure of climate mitigation, failure of climate adaptation, and natural disaster and extreme weather events, uh, which are the biggest risk for the global economy. And that may be a surprise for, for, for many of you, but, uh, but this is also demonstrating that the issues that we are dealing there, they are also economically very viable. Next, please. And one of the initiatives that we are having on the table is this early warning services for all, which where we got the mandate from Secretary General uh, Guterres a year ago, and at the moment, only half of our 193 members have proper early warning services in place, and we have major gaps 
especially in Africa, in many Asian countries and, and also many island uh, states. And our, our desire is that in, in five years, uh, we would reach 100% coverage of the proper early warning services. Next, please. And, and this was uh, this was the mandate that we got, and uh, and, and this was uh, endorsed by COP27. And thanks for the government of Egypt for for your great support for that that initiative. Next, please. And in COP27, we launched this uh, with the presence of Secretary General Guterres, uh, ten heads of state, uh, CEOs, and for example, Microsoft President Brad Smith was uh, was present at uh, at the event. Next, please. And now our challenge is to implement it, and uh, we have already some money to to proceed, and uh, and we need more resources, and uh, and and we have started also interacting with uh, with the COP28 president. I was a few weeks ago meeting uh, Dr. Al Zaber, who is the president of uh, COP28, and here in Geneva we have joined forces with uh, UNDRR, with uh, Red Cross, Red Croissant, uh, and uh, ITU, and uh, and and next week in in. New York will be launched the first uh, high-level uh, advisory panel uh, in the presence of, uh, of Guterres. Next, please. And one of the challenges that we are having is that we have major gaps in the basic observing systems, both the ground-based uh, stations, uh, all these red areas indicate the data sparse areas, it's Africa, uh, Caribbean, Pacific Islands especially, and same is true for this upper air sounding measurements, which are also needed, and, and uh, again, Many parts of the world are red, and 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 that's our first uh, challenge to improve the basic observing systems. Next, please. Then we are dealing with uh, greenhouse gases, and and we have seen steady increase of the of the concentrations of uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, and we are running global atmosphere watch network, which is uh, monitoring these gases. Next, please. And, uh, but we have limited understanding of the of the carbon dioxide budget. It's not enough that we understand the emissions, but we also have to understand what's happening uh, with in, in interaction with uh, vegetation. And this land use uh, uh, component carries very big uh, uncertainty, and also these natural sinks of uh, carbon dioxide uh, they are carrying big uh, uncertainty. Next, please. And that's why we have created a new initiative to monitor. The greenhouse gas budgets by using satellite data from uh, USA, China, and Japan, and also our 150 global atmosphere watch stations and modeling tools to simulate what's happening in in real atmosphere uh, with those those uh, three gases. Next, please. And our third initiative is related to climate modeling. With the current climate models, we can estimate fairly well what's going to happen to the averages of uh, climate, but we are not able to de describe what's going to happen to the weather extremes and, and also this, uh, this rainfall amounts of future. And for example, melting of the Antarctic uh, glacier, which is one of the big uncertainties uh, in our climate uh, science. And that's why we have uh, a new initiative to, to go to higher resolution of climate modeling, to go to one kilometer scale modeling, and, and that would allow us to describe these extremes and uh, water cycle and, and also uh, melting of glaciers much better than with the current current models. Next, please. And here, here you can see, for example, the IPCC scenarios for, for rainfall amounts and uh, estimates uh, depending on temperature and also the, uh, the soil moisture depending on, 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 on warming rate. But uh, the impacts of climate change, they are very much felt through extremes and uh, with the current modeling systems, we have difficulties in describing those. Next, please. And for example, these events that we saw in 21, like the flooding in, in Germany and, and the flooding uh, last summer in Pakistan, they were not uh, such risks, were not estimated by the current uh, climate models. And, and our dream is that we would have the biggest possible supercomputing resources and, and uh, and leading scientists to, to create such a such a modeling system. Next, please. And so far, we have carried out major reforms here at WMO, thanks to great staff and uh, collaboration with our our member states. We have uh, uh, simplified our technical commission structure. We have engaged uh, science community more in our work, and also private sector is becoming more and more important player in our our field. And here in Secretariat, we have. New management, we have been able to reallocate resources 
to hire plenty of young experts for this organization and we have these new initiatives uh, early warning services for all crews and software which are supposed to support uh, further development of uh, of of, the, of 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 services at the country level next please that's all from my side and uh, and and thanks for the opportunity to address you and uh, and we may have further discussions uh, upstairs if you have a chance to join our nice party there thank you Thank you, Professor Talas. Now I'm honored to give the floor to Mr. Selvin Hart, Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General on Climate Action and Just Transition. Mr. Hart, on Zoom, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. And um, I am really pleased to be part of this important event to celebrate World Meteorological Day. And I wish to pay tribute to my colleague and friend, Professor Talos, and the excellent members of staff, committed and dedicated members um, of staff of WMO. Thank you so much for your continued leadership and for your um, hard and excellent work. And one year ago today, the UN Secretary General launched the Early Warning System for All initiative with an aim to ensure that every person on earth is protected with early, by early warning systems by 2027. Earlier this year, he also laid out his top climate priorities for 2023, narrowing the growing emissions gap and delivering climate justice for those on the front lines of the climate crisis. And let me be blunt, we are really at a very critical moment in our fight against the climate crisis. And as Professor Talos um, stated earlier, um, in a few hours, hopefully, or in a few days, the IPCCC will finalize its six assessment um, report. But we already know it will basically say that every indicator on climate is trending in the wrong direction. Global emissions are are at their highest level in human history, and they continue to rise. Credible pathways to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and prevent the worst impacts of the climate crisis are narrowing with each passing day of insufficient action to cut carbon pollution. Meanwhile, at present levels of warming, we are witnessing unprecedented impacts on every continent, in every region and in every country, from wildfires to droughts, floods, and superstorms. The scale and magnitude of losses and damage from the climate crisis are growing exponentially. Billions of lives are hanging in the balance. It is unacceptable that the countries and peoples and communities that have contributed the least to creating this crisis are paying the hev heaviest price. Over the last 50 years, nearly 70% of all deaths from climate-related disasters have occurred in the 46 poorest countries, in the least developed countries. We know that early warning systems saves lives and livelihoods and deliver great financial benefits. Disaster mortality rates are eight times lower in countries with strong early warning coverage. And just 24 hours of notice of an incoming climate hazard can reduce damage by 30%. And yet, as Professor Talos indicated, half of the world lacks coverage, especially small island developing states and the least developed countries. And six out of every 10 Africans are not covered by an effective early warning system. We must reverse this injustice. So Excellencies, colleagues and friends, providing universal multi-hazard early warning systems for all is long overdue. We must rapidly move towards implementation on the ground. The vision of the Secretary General for this initiative is for it to build on and scale up existing efforts, building synergies across the early warning systems value chain. Coordination and collaboration will be key to delivering at the scale and with the impact the world desperately needs. We cannot continue to operate in silos. It is an inefficiency 
we cannot afford and must not accept. It is also an inefficiency that is costing lives and livelihoods. The Secretary General has entrusted the leadership to WMO and UNDRR, together with ITU and the IFRC, to work closely with the broader UN system or development partners, the private sector and civil society to pool expertise as well as financial and technological resources. He has made it clear he expects initial results to be showcased at his upcoming Climate Ambition Summit in September and a full progress report by COP28 in the UAE. I urge all of you to work together to get the job done. You can be assured of the Secretary General and the entire UN system's full support and commitment in this effort. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hart. Now I have the pleasure and honor to give the floor to Ambassador Jürg Lauber, permanent representative of Switzerland to the UN in Geneva. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General, Mr. Secretary General Emeritus, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, dear young delegates, I see a few there in the middle. Colleagues, friends, today it was mentioned uh, already we are celebrating one century and a half of collaboration between scientists from around the world in all areas related to climate, weather and water. On behalf of Switzerland, I would like to extend our warmest congratulations to the entire meteorological community for its 150th anniversary. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Thank you, Petri, for giving us a glimpse into the history of meteorology. I learned a lot. I knew about the Geneva disaster, I've heard before, but I want to tell you you're safe, uh, at least for the next few years when I look at, uh, at your map. Ladies and gentlemen, for a century and a half, scientists have been looking up towards the sky to understand what may fall down onto our heads. They have also, and perhaps more importantly, been looking around, around to find partners with whom they could share knowledge, get peer reviews, and ultimately build a comprehensive corpus of science. Their collective efforts allow us to predict the weather, to warn us of impending disasters, and maybe most importantly, to tackle the global climate crisis. In the 19th century, Previous generations of scientists and diplomats laid the foundations of multilateralism. They worked on the big issues of the time, such as expanding telegraph and railway lines, the first global postal service, or breakthroughs in meteorology, which led to the creation, some were mentioned already, of the International Telegraph Union, today the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, in 1865, the Universal Postal Union in 1874, or the year before, the International Meteorological Union, today WMO, in 1873. The world has changed a lot since then. We do not have exactly the same problems. For example, I understand that Weather advice for zeppelins are not that much in high demand and not on your top list of priorities uh, any longer. Meanwhile, and it's a cliche, of course, we face a lot of new challenges and global warming, as we know it today, was unimaginable 150 years ago. What has remained consistent and, and proven true time and again is that we are better at solving such problems if we do it together. Today, international cooperation, the pooling of knowledge, of expertise, and of resources is our best chance to solve the issues related to climate change. This is, of course, easier said than done. Science must play a central role in shaping policymaking. It must guide our efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change. In this context, 
I also wish the International Panel on Climate Change every success in finalizing and adopting their synthesis report this week in what I understand is in Interlaken, a very nice place at the foot of the Swiss Alps. I hope it helps them. It will inspire them to come to good conclusions. Ladies and gentlemen, Switzerland is proud to host International Geneva, which we consider the foremost center of global governance. Geneva provides a fertile ground for solutions commensurate to the challenges of our time. It allows states and other stakeholders to talk to each other, and it provides ideal conditions for a, multi for a multilateral and interdisciplinary ecosystem. Consider, for instance, the nexus between health, biodiversity, climate, migration, trade, and the humanitarian emergencies. You will find important expertise on all of these areas here in Geneva, which allows for comprehensive solutions to these complex challenges. What challenges will we be facing 150 years from now? I don't know. Our responsibility, though, as a global community here and today is to preserve the great legacy of multilateralism, to make it fit for the purpose of our time, but also to pass it on to future generations for them to join forces and tackle their own problems. Dear colleagues, Switzerland has always been a strong supporter of the early warnings for all initiative and action plan. Both will be at the heart of the efforts deployed by the entire UN system with the goal to ensure that anyone threatened by a climate hazard, including slow disasters such as droughts, will have a chance to act in a timely manner. It is our collective responsibility to be prepared and to ensure that a sustainable and equitable future for our planet and for our generations can be achieved. For, sorry, for future generations can be achieved. Organizations such as WMO provide reliable scientific data, which are indispensable for the design and implementation of effective policies. Thank you very much. And again, happy anniversary. Thank you, Mr. Lover. Now, His Excellency Mr. Ahmed Ihab Gamal el -Din, Permanent Representative of Egypt to the UN in Geneva, will give an address. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Brigitte, dear moderator, Mr. Secretary General Talas, uh, dear Secretary General Emeritus, Mr. Giraud, uh, Deputy Secretary Gen uh, General, Madam Manenkova, distinguished ambassadors and and guests and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me congratulate you all for, on the occasion of WMO's uh, uh, 150th anniversary of the World Meteorological Day. Uh, the WMO has become indeed uh, an indispensable organization that whose importance has been increasing exponentially and more relevant today than ever. Uh, it was a distinct pleasure for the Egyptian presidency to be working very closely with WMO in the run-up to COP27. And I would like to give just a little uh, uh, background on COP27, which was indeed one of the mega multilateral events uh, held in the, in the past history, and it hosted over 48,000. Uh, participants and 120 heads of states, in addition to heads of UN organizations, head of multilateral development banks, international finance institutions, private sectors, 10,000 representatives from NGOs representing 1,649 organizations, uh, all participated in the COP. The COP presidency also, for the first time, it, uh, it made a youth-led climate forum and the children and youth pavilion and we appointed for the first time a COP presidency youth envoy. And our role as COP presidency was to ensure that all these voices be heard in the various streams during the COP itself. Our goal was to have an implementation COP guided by scientific findings from the relevant international institutions, primarily and most importantly, the WMO itself, the IPCC, the UNEP and UNFCCC, 
uh, and we try to focus from shifting from pledges and commitments to delivery and action. However, we were faced with the complexity of a global scene, which was uh, with, where we witnessed the geopolitical tensions, the decline in the global economy, the food and energy crises, increasing interest rates, international trade and supply chains being disrupted, COVID-19 repercussions, high debt levels, and reversing development gains in developing countries, and limited delivery on climate action and outcomes of previous COPs. We try to focus on concrete results and ensure effective climate action and better and for a better and more prosperous future for the next generations. With regards to the main outcomes that I would like to highlight is the uh, Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan, which is a decision that ensured the balance between ambition and implementation between mitigation and adaptation and stress the importance of science for effective climate action and it focused on the synergies between climate and biodiversity. This decision referred for the first time to the right to clean, healthy and sustainable environment, to climate justice, food security, water security and the need to foster early warning systems. We also uh, are particularly proud that uh, we among the many outcomes of the COP, there was a work program on just transition. There was a landmark mitigation work program until 2026. There was also the Sharm el-Sheikh adaptation agenda to accelerate transformative action. And where there was uh, 30 adaptation outcomes that were agreed to enhance resilience for 4 billion people living in the most climate vulnerable communities by 2030. And also the Secretary General Initiative on Early Warning System for All, in which WMO had a leading role. We need to foster this early warning system, uh, and this was highlighted in the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan. We also would like to say that in relation to water issues, uh, first time ever in COP history, uh, the COP covering decision included language on water and its links with climate change. The covering decision addressed the importance of integrating water, not only in adaptation, but also in adaptation co-benefits, which include mitigation and sustainable development more broadly. Um, let me also say that COP presidency held a roundtable on water scarce security, in which heads of state stressed the basic human need for sustainable access to adequate quantities of water for sustaining livelihoods and socioeconomic development. We also held the first ever dedicated water day in which leaders and experts acknowledged the escalating water security challenge. And we held a, a water pavilion. Uh, and also we launched the AWARE initiative which, with the support of WMO. And this initiative, it builds on the need to link science and policy efforts and offers an opportunity for all stakeholders to strengthen the integration of water and climate agendas. We also uh, are building and complementing on the initiatives like the Secretary General Initiative on Early Warning System and the Climate Leaders Panel, which is also being uh, spearheaded by WMO. As far as next steps, we are pleased to be in very strong coordination with our brothers from the United Arab Emirates, uh, whom to, for whom we wish the best of luck in their COP presidency. We are all going to be witnessing the UN Water Conference in New York. Uh, I understand that on the 20th and 21st of March, there is the Copenhagen Ministerial Climate Meeting, with, which is co-led by the uh, COP presidency of 20, COP27 presidency and the incoming uh, COP28 presidency with the participation of about 50 ministers. So best of luck to all to push the climate agenda forward and happy anniversary and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Ambassador Gamal Eldin. After COP27, COP28 is heading our way. Ambassador Ahmed Al Jarman, permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates, what can we expect from this COP? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excellencies, uh, Secretary General, honorable participant, it gives me a great pleasure to participate at the World Meteorological Day Ceremony. Uh, 
organized today in headquarters of this prestigious organization, which celebrates this year its 150th anniversary. The theme of the celebration this year, namely the future of the weather, climate, and water across generation is very appropriate. In the same spirit, the UAE as a host of COP28 pays a particular attention to the future generation. For this reason, we nominate Her Excellencies Shamal Mazroui, the minister, the COP28 Youth Climate Champion. A new role designed to elevate a global youth voice through the COP process and represent young generation and young voice. It's highly important to associate a new generation in the decision-making process. Their contribution bring a real added value to adopt a very pragmatic and realistic vision. More generally, COP28 presents an opportunity to get the world back to track, to develop an ambitious and pragmatic path towards the decarbonization of the global economy and innovate a cup process through leave no one behind approach and in this inclusive of the various stakeholders accountable for commitment and accountable on solution. It offers also the opportunity to enhance the solidarity between the global North and South, including the public and private sector scientists and civil society, women and youth, and builds trust in multilateral process. Finally, it's our pleasure to welcome you all next November in UAE to drive meaningful outcome of the realistic solution that support the environment transition. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency. The official addresses have now come to an end and it is time for a short break with an inspiring video tracing the history and the importance of the work of IMO and WMO, thanks to my colleagues Akio, Jesse and Yvon, who have been digging in, into all the, the, the rooms below uh, in the, in the um, in the background and uh, all the space of WMO that no one ever sees. So let's go with the video. Our weather, climate and water cycle have no national or political boundaries. International cooperation is essential. This philosophy has driven the work of the world's meteorological community since 1873. The history of weather forecasting dates to the late 19th century with the standardization of maritime data and meteorological observations at sea. Improved technologies such as the telegraph allow the transmission of weather reports more quickly and easily. The first International Meteorological Congress in 1873 in Vienna established the need for a worldwide network. This allowed countries to exchange data freely, establishing an international agreement on standardized methods and units of observation. The 20th century saw significant advances. The biggest stride came with the advent of meteorological satellites in the 1960s. This led to the launch of the World Weather Watch program. Today, Technological advances have greatly improved the accuracy of weather forecasts and life-saving early warnings. Big data is being exchanged more freely among a wider community, and there are now new tools, including machine learning and artificial intelligence. The changing climate is a reminder of the urgent action needed now. We must slash emissions and ensure that future generations survive and thrive on our planet. Far too many people in vulnerable countries lack even rudimentary early warnings that let them know dangerous weather is headed their way. That is why WMO is spearheading a new early warnings for all initiative to ensure that early warning systems protect everyone. 
The initiative embraces the entire WMO community, the wider UN family, development banks, and the private sector. Together, we must boost the power of prediction for everyone and build their capacity to act. Our weather, climate, and water cycle will be different in the future than in the past. Weather, climate, and hydrological services will help us tackle the associated challenges and seize the opportunities. The WMO has achieved remarkable milestones in the past, is constantly making significant progress, and has ambitious plans for the future. Michael Stodinger, you are the former permanent representative of WMO for Austria, and the whole history of IMO started in Vienna, right? Right. Thanks very much. And looking back to 1873, and we have seen already some pictures that the Secretary General showed to us. Looking back can be very interesting. It can be depressing if you open your desk and try to clean it up and see all the things which you started once but didn't pursue can also be very inspiring if you look like in organizations like WMO, where you see how the core of an idea was founded long ago, and it grew and grew and grew with the technical possibilities which they had to be in over the time. And this is what we see when I was looking back at the 1873 uh, Congress minutes. Uh, you see some real jewels in there, how people interacted, how people got things going and how they achieved what today is the basis, what we need for the early warning systems, for climate research, and for the look into the future, what will happen with the climate in the next couple of years. So uh, we see and we can learn what uh, WMO can do to serve society in the future and how we can keep the spirit of cooperation and innovation, which was so important for all of us. Then in 1873, the questions to be discussed had been prepared at a conference in Leipzig the year before, and very important, the correspondence. And if you see the letters that these scientists wrote to each other, it's really inspiring how much they went into detail, how concise and how focused they were, and how they prepared the meeting very well in advance. The task was to find a common system for observations for exchange and treatment of the data. And it was done then there by forming commissions work on details and these commissions were formed during the congress and worked during these two weeks and achieved already agreement on 99 percent of those things they were discussing but most important there was an astronomer who also worked as part-time meteorologist there emile plantamour from geneva and he was the one who said we need an international agency to do all that over time over the countries and he would never have dreamt i guess that WMO will be located in Geneva. He's buried at the Cimetière du Roi in, in Geneva here. And I think we should think, the Genevans should thank him very much that he brought in the idea then at the time. Now, the Minister of Science was there and he said, uh, it's a fruitful thought through the personnel exchange of ideas between the scientists to have the a greater weight on metrology, which means it was something nice to do. And metrology at the time was an academic, not even problem, was an academic topic. In the meantime, it has become an existential question for the survival of humanity. And from this fruitful thought that he said, this was picked up by the scientists and this was really brought into action. And that's quite interesting to see. Now, the weather maps and the exchange of data before the Congress. In the US, 1843, they had already weather maps which were daily published. The same in the UK, you see a different format, different standard, the same in France in 63, and in Austria, 65, had a weather map. But what you also see, these maps were just for the area of these kingdoms of the, of the monarchy or wherever it was. What was done then during the, the Congress, and this was General Meyer, a U.S. Uh, general, 
brigade general. And he said, we need as many stations as practicable throughout the world and have them at least once a day, the observations being sent to each other to central points. And this was achieved, the map, this is a Swedish map from 74. This was achieved within one year. And you can see how close the interaction between these people were and how efficiently they interacted. Now, how was all this achieved and how does it look like today? You see this barometer temperature humidity, which was measured then. Of course, today, this looks by the fact of 100,000 or a million times more complicated with the satellite and Petri Dallas has already uh, mentioned the satellites, which now give data in a density which is a million times higher than we had it in the past. But the standards for the stations and the standard for the, for the backbone of the system for calibration, this was founded then in 1873, where comparisons were made, which instruments would be suitable, how should uh, these instruments be used, how should they be measured, and how the data exchange look like in details. So this started then at the time. Now, the seven commissions which they formed. Could I have the next slide? Uh -huh. Were very technical. And you don't need to read all the details. They were, when should you observe the moment of humidity and so on. No? But there was, I think, the most important one is the seventh one, the last one, the execution of resolutions and the international agency. We said, we need a body who looks at what we decide now that this is really, it's being done, and uh, we have an agency that looks after it. Of course, this agency wasn't founded then at the time. It was staying the uh, exchange between scientists for a long time, or between the meteorological services, and it was just in 1950 when WMO came in as the real service as we know it today. Now, the constituent bodies reform in 19, it cleaned up these commissions, which partly survived then at the time as they had been defined then in 1873 for infrastructure and services and a research board, which meant in the end that WMO was stepping out of this academic ivory tower and focusing towards the services. I think this is the most important task for the future, deliver services as you need them. Now, another tool which I found in the, in the minutes there was the, uh, the Belgium delegate, Bui Palo, no? and he said, and the German is much nicer than my poor English translation, but he said, shouldn't we express our hope no? that an international fund be created financing installment and maintenance observations on islands and remote locations, which meant this fellow was thinking about how things would be implemented and not just how do you measure, but how would you work in practically where some countries had high resources, others much less. But it took another 145 years until someone like Markus Rebnik came up and said, well, we have to put it on the ground and uh, started the SOF initiative, which is now underpinning what we heard beforehand from Selvin Hart, the, the long overdue early warning for all system with observations, because without observations, you cannot make precise warnings. And uh, in COP, Shamal Sheikh, this picture was taken here, as you see, there you see three ministers of finance amongst them, the Austrian as well, and the, the head of the Nordic Development Fund. And this is where a big pledges were made also from US America to support the work of soft, to support the work of having these observing stations. Now, another really important part at the time then were the warnings. And uh, it's shortly beforehand, Fitzroy, he was the captain of the boat, the Beagle, who uh, sailed with uh, Darwin around the world and where the origin of species was basically sketched already in, in its first uh, draft. And he came back to the UK and in, after the, the Krim War, the Royal Charter, which was a boat bringing uh, soldiers back from, from the Krim Island into to UK, it drowned just half a mile in front of the coast due to a very heavy storm. And this inspired him to install a warning service with simple observations, saying there's a storm coming and he had enough experience as a, as a sailor and as a captain of a boat. Uh, if you see a storm, you should communicate the information. And he had a very simple system with triangles, storm, and the triangle plus a cylinder underneath, uh, which means heavy storm. So a little bit like we have today, the CUP to common alert protocol standardized. Now, 
a storm is coming, what should be done? The problem was, and this is also, I think, quite instructive how, to, how science and how practical services work. The, these forecasts were based on very poor observations. They were not these ships as we have them today. There were no numerical models. The whole synoptic methodology had not been developed then at the time yet. So some of these forecasts were right and they're very helpful. Others were not so good because they missed an event or they were warning at an area where the storm did not take place. And envy between scientists is something which still exists somehow today. And the, the Royal Meteorological Society didn't like this at all. And he could not make these forecasts then anymore because the, the error rate was too large. And he committed suicide two years later because he just couldn't live with the fact that there was a system which would be helpful, which was not perfect, certainly not perfect at the time, but which was not accepted by society. Now, this all this, this drama is reflected in the discussion in the 73 meeting. And uh, you see Campbell, he was representative of Yuki Met Office then, uh, it had a different name at the time. Uh, and he said, and it's quite interesting from the argumentation. Uh, he said, it has been mentioned that the English scale cannot be avoided as it's the only one seamen know to those assistance should be provided. So his argumentation was very much in practical term, whom is the warning for? And the seamen, they know the English system. And of course, in the Anglo-Saxon world, the, the seamen were the Britannia, ruled the waves and so they had a very important role at the time. Uh, Mayer, the American uh, delegate, uh, he had a much uh, more sophisticated argumentation using in the in the in the discussion which warning system should be used then. And he said for practical purposes, the English would be possibly one, but for the sake of international exchange, he would be ready to accept any scale recommended by Congress. And I think this is one of the key moments in an argumentation, also in the discussions we're having here at Congress, Executive Council, and so on. The readiness of partners to say, well, uh, I think my system is the best, which everybody thinks, no? but uh, I'm ready to compromise. I'm ready to take someone else's system, change my system in my country for the sake of, we have an international system, but that's what they all agreed on. It needs to be an international system. Um, all of them will be working on. And the, the last point I'd like to show was the, the problem about uh, how they saw the quality of the forecast and the probabilities or the the, the exactness of these forecasts. Now, and one discussion was uh, that people were calling these forecasts prophecies or divination. Now, uh, the, the wording in, in German is very 19th century and it's difficult to translate into to nowadays English or American English. There was a protest in general, as they said, against the term infallibility. Now, so they, they were aware that these forecasts were imperfect, but they were aware that it poses a problem with the audience how good are these forecasts and how can they be used? And they agreed on, we said, it's an opinion on the weather. Now it's just to have a relative uh, measure so they could not be held too much liable. And also their reputation would not be challenged too much by, by, this, uh, by this quality, which wasn't perfect. Now today, and this was the work of WMO of the many working groups in, in here, you have warnings for civil protection. And this is a little map well, you have a probability map for a certain threshold for wind speed in different levels. How probable is it that more 80 kilometers are going to happen there? And you have a very precise map for a location and for a time. And it would change 20 minutes later, would have another map. And so people have, especially professionals, they have an information which they can work with. Because otherwise, if you say there's a 50% chance of rain tomorrow in Switzerland, some of them would interpret it, this is 50% means half of the day. Others would say 50% means half of Switzerland. You have to come down to the point and you need for these probabilities, you need a dialogue with the users. So they really understand what you wanna say. This is an even more serious problem now if you talk about climate forecasts. And this is from the IPCC, the, the sixth assessment report, where you have a very precise information on the, the fat tail, as statisticians call it, no? this uh, low likelihood, but the very serious consequence. And you see the probability for the different emission scenarios, this, the strongest one, the medium and the, and the weakest one. And you also have a probability for the, for the less serious consequences. And then you can, uh, with uh, uh, Bayesian statistics, for example, of conditional probabilities, you can have a very precise uh, 
interaction and say, well, this is where I want to make my investments for mitigation, for adaptation, and so on. 32 people were there. And uh, you see they came from all parts of the world, Spain, Netherlands, German Empire, Great Britain, China, and so on. No? They were interacting very intensively at the Congress and later on as well. One fellow who was there it was Julius Hahn. He was a very young fellow at the Congress in, in the, the 73. He was about 30 years old. And 50 years later, after the Austrian-Hungarian Empire went into self-destruction after Sarajevo, uh, Austria, the new Austria was very poor. And public servants had basically no pension or nothing to, to, to live on. And despite uh, the, those people from, from UK and from the US who were sitting on the other side of the trenches of the, of the Great War, uh, they, and this is, uh, Dimitar Ivanov sent this to me from the Brilliant of the American Med Society, they sent out under the notes that Julius Hahn, who was there at the, at the 73 Congress, he's in distress and he's in immediate need of food and fuel. And so they were taking care of each other 50 years later. And I think it's another sign how closely knitted this society was. And I think it's even more for us to sign how the meteorological community should work together to face the challenges all of us has with the climate crisis, which really gets existential, as I said before. So conclusions for this travel, and I may quote Professor Talas, as you often said, rightly, back to the basics. Focus on the most important things and get things done. I think this is extremely important to uh, achieve what you want to achieve. Second, to regain the spirit of conviviality, supporting each other, accepting each other points of view and supporting each other by making compromises and be ready to change your own system if uh, you need a common solution. Integrate science and innovation as main drivers for the development. And I think this has been done in the last couple of years very much already. And with the soft initiative, with the early warnings of all initiatives, will be done even more in the future. And I may come back to the message from Esra. As she says in a letter to the mother, our future is slipping from our grasp. And I think it describes very well what's happening at the moment. It's a problem is only that we are too little aware of it. And that's why raise the WMO voice in this question is extremely important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Stodinger, for this exceptional travel uh, in time. As Russ message to the mom, our future is slipping from our grasp. But is it really happening? Or is, it, is there still some hope? To discuss this, we have today with us two speakers. Ms. Neo Gim Huai, who is the Managing Director of the Center for Nature and Climate at the World Economic Forum. And Mr. Ed Hawkins, Professor of Climate Science at the University of Reading, who is also the creator of the famous stripes that we have seen a lot uh, during uh, COP26. A first question to you, Gim Huey. Natural disasters and extreme weather events are ranking among the top three issues of high concern uh, on the WEF's annual global risk report. We've seen it uh, before uh, on SG slide. We, you can see it now again, both for short term and for long term. How do you think leaders can push these issues as a priority, considering other pressing issues like military conflict or economic crisis? Thank you, uh, Bridget, and uh, thank you to, for inviting me to celebrate uh, the WMO Day uh, and your 150th uh, anniversary. For those of you who are not familiar with the Global Risk Survey, we do this on an annual basis. It surveys uh, 1,200 leaders uh, from public business sectors around the world to get a sense of how they look at risks uh, in the immediate term, two years horizon, as well as over the next uh, decade. And the fact that uh, environmental risks has been ranked uh, high in the latest round of surveys is not new, right? It's actually been um, the same outcomes are being surveyed uh, over the last years. Uh, the good news is that there is widespread recognition that uh, environmental risks, whether this is the failure of climate action, mitigation, adaptation, collapse of ecosystems, biodiversity loss, um, extreme weather events, 
are actually top of mind uh, for many of these uh, decision makers. What was actually more disturbing for me uh, was also uh, reflected in the survey, it's not on this slide, uh, which actually asked about risk preparedness, right? Uh, how prepared are we in dealing with the risks? And um, what, I, uh, what we have was about five, only five to 10% of the respondents felt that our preparedness towards climate issues uh, was effective or highly effective. So the majority actually felt that this was, we're still not doing enough, right, to deal with the risks that are quite evident uh, in, in our environment. The, the other point I thought that would be useful to highlight here is that the risks are not to be viewed in isolation because if you actually read through the list of risks here, they are interconnected, right? Um, and uh, the growing recognition among businesses uh, that is more telling is that these risks are not just interconnected, they are actually interrelating with one another creating a cascading effects <clears throat> on our social economic systems that each on their own would exert uh, by themselves, right? And which is why at the last uh, annual meeting in Davos in January, we actually term it a polycrisis. So a polycrisis is not just multiple crises happening, but is the fact that these crises are interrelating with each other, creating much more dire consequences. And what this means is that the way we think about the response, right, uh, and this was really very much reflected in the conversations that we had in Davos, was the need for us to really take a very uh, holistic uh, systems approach in dealing with the issues. So don't deal with them in isolation. But as we deal with the environmental issues, we also need to think about social issues, uh, economic stability issues, and, uh, and, and take a systems lens, right, uh, in, in uh, addressing the various aspects. Uh, four out of five respondents uh, in the survey actually talk about the fact that they anticipate increased volatility over the next few years, right? Uh, I come from the financial sector. In fact, the word that we were using was chaos. It was not just about volatile uh, state of the world, but it, it would be likely chaotic, right? Uh, meaning that the future is something that will need to be created it is not just going to be an easy projection based on the past. And if you ask the climate scientists, they will also tell you that it's becoming harder and harder to predict weather patterns because uh, you're dealing with extreme events happening at a much more regular um, uh, uh, occurrence uh, than, uh, than they have ever witnessed before. Uh, the last point I wanted to highlight here is just to end on a, on a more positive note is that when we actually think about risks, we also want to look at opportunities, right? Uh, and within the, the forum, the way we've talked about it is, let's talk about a transitions, not just for net zero, but nature positive, and also um, a, a much more uh, resource uh, sensitive uh, way of, uh, of building our agricultural industrial systems. It's evident that the past should not be what the future should look like. It cannot be, it's unsustainable. We are reaching tipping points. Right, uh, and the way we look at the social economic systems uh, is across three dimensions uh, in terms of agriculture, land, ocean use, in terms of our built environment, uh, our urban uh, infrastructure, and finally also in the energy extractives industry. Right, And each of these sectors, there are actually transitions that can actually bring about uh, investment opportunities and good returns. And uh, even as we deal with the risk, we can actually look at investing into transitions across each of these three systems and working together to actually uh, create a, a future that is, uh, that is uh, what we all seek, to, seek, to, uh, seek for our children to inherit uh, across generations. Thank you. I'll pause here. Thank you very much. Now a question for you, Ed Hawkins. You're joining from the UK. Um, how can communication and data visualization help the leaders and the businesses? And what is the risk to make science more accessible? Thank you. And it's lovely to be here uh, joining you all on this very, very special day. So first of all, I think, you know, it's important to try and ensure that people understand that much of climate science is quite a simple problem. It may seem quite complex at first. But if we talk about when we've understood the science, we can go back to the time that Fitzroy was making the first 
weather weather forecasts back in the 1850s and 1860s, we understood then through the work of Eunice Foote and John Tyndall that greenhouse gases, uh, adding them to the atmosphere, would warm the planet. It's a very simple bit of physics, which was understood before the WMO was founded. And so in many ways, it's a very simple problem, and we need to explain it simply to people so they can understand. Um, and of course, the warming stripes that you can probably see on the screen um, are one way of communicating the fact, the simple fact that our world has warmed over the last 170 years. We see the colors change from, from blue to red. It's a very simple visualization. It explains what's going on in one very simple, stark visual way. Uh, and anyone can see what's going on. They can see the science. Um, and you don't need any special skills or qualifications to understand with one glance what's going on to our climate. And so this type of approach of simplifying our visualization can reach many, many more people. Anyone can understand what's going on. And I think that's critical because as, as the famous um, climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe says, the most important thing we can do about climate science and about the climate is to talk about it. And having these visualizations, which are very simple, it may enables people to start conversations with their friends and their family and their colleagues uh, about the risks that we face. And this very, very simple way of communicating is one way we can go about doing that. And it's been inspiring to see so many people adopt this very simple way of communicating. Um, we've seen rock bands use the stripes to, to start conversation during their gigs. Um, we've seen fashion designers adopt the stripes and make dresses and outfits um, from the stripes, which have been on the, on the catwalks at London Fashion Week, for example. Uh, and a major football team in my hometown of Reading um, have adopted the stripes on the sleeves of their kit for this season. And they've been playing all, all over the country, starting conversations um, about climate change. And so we are reaching new audiences, starting conversations amongst a whole range of people who would not normally talk about climate. And I think that's one very critical way that we have to communicate. And if you want more complexity, then great. There's the IPCC reports to go and read to understand all of the complexities and all of the details. But we do need a wide range of ways of communicating. Um, and um, the, the stripes are one way that we can do that very, very simply. Thank you very much, Ed. So the most important thing we can do about climate change is to talk about it. And it's probably also the case with businesses. Gim Hoi, what is the role of businesses in accelerating climate change adaptation today? the risks right um and two uh to look at how they can proactively manage the risks uh working across uh, the value chain and uh, partnering with uh, government and civil society uh and finally also uh not just to view this as a risk but to invest in products and services that could actually support um, adaptation strategies uh within the ecosystem and uh, make this into a, a competitive advantage for themselves Right. Um, just on the first point around understanding the risks, um, and this is uh, more recent that they're starting to recognize that, well, the, the CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, did do an analysis to say that, look, on water, the risk of inaction uh, is about five times more than the cost of action today. Right. Uh, so it's a lot cheaper if you act today than to procrastinate and, and then it gets costlier uh, to adjust. And when we did a recent analysis of uh, 100 largest companies, uh, 87 of them actually identified physical climate risks as a key issue to deal with, which will impact at least 10% of their global revenues. Just having these numbers on the table give them a sense on the kinds of uh, investments that's needed, or at least the amount of budget that they should set aside uh, within their balance sheet to deal proactively with the issues on the table. And alongside with that, uh, we also have analysis to say that, look, uh, for every dollar that you invest into climate adaptation, you're going to get a fourfold return back for your investment dollar. So these numbers actually help provide uh, gut rails, right? Uh, or guiding posts uh, for companies to think through their business strategy. I thought it would be useful to highlight three areas um, that we should uh, be quite systematically in, in addressing or in har harvesting uh, the opportunities. So one is around data. And this is where WMO and the work of uh, your community plays a very significant part. One of our companies uh, that's based in California 
actually makes very systematic use of the data uh, of the of the vicinity to anticipate wildfires. And you know, California was hit by severe wildfires um, uh, just a few years ago. And by being able to better anticipate wildfires and the occurrence of this, uh, they were able to work with the governments to put in place the right infrastructure uh, to respond. And this in turn safeguards energy, uh, the infrastructure as well as lives and property. The second area that is also needs um, uh, a lot more uh, attention is around finance, right? How can finance actually play an active role in uh, either it is in insurance solutions or in blended finance to look at how we can safeguard our infrastructure and uh, for for weather uh, weather events. Uh, Swiss Re, uh, one of our companies that's based in Switzerland, actually has been uh, working to provide uh, nature-based solutions to enhance uh, coastal resilience. The third area, um, uh, if you can guess right, is obviously in technologies, data finance technology. And uh, technology is also uh, widely deployed, especially in a lot of the emerging economies. So again, uh, one of our companies based in India uh, is actually working alongside with the farmers to look at how um, technology solutions, whether this is in irrigation, whether this is in the kinds of seeds that are being used, whether this is in uh, nutrient management can actually be adapted uh, to changing weather conditions. And, and this really helps uh, better prepare uh, businesses as well as communities in adapting to um, changing uh, weather patterns and building more resilience uh, in, in the supply chains. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, wrong data is definitely a problem. Uh, Ed, why is it important, so important, to have high quality and trustable data to inform climate action? You have made a lot of research on this. Thank you, yes. So I mean, without observations, we're, we're, we're blind to what's going on. And the Secretary General has already highlighted the fact that we have large gaps in our observation networks uh, today. Um, and, and that's also true for when we look back uh, in the past as well. Um, data is critical to understand how the climate is changing. We would not be able to make the, the stripes or any other visualization um, about our changing climate without that historical data that was taken by many thousands of people, billions of observations um, that, that were taken, which goes into making up these, these understanding of how the global temperature has changed, for example. Many of those um, observers were volunteers. They didn't, you know, didn't have a grand vision in mind of, of measuring the, 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 the climate as it was, but they still took those observations every day. Uh, and we need to thank them for, for, for their diligent efforts. Um, but it's also important to note that we don't have all of the information that we could do. And that's true today, but it's also true um, about the past. There are archives in most countries around the world which are full of uh, old observations which have not been transformed from those handwritten paper formats into digital data that we can use today to understand the changes in our climate and the changes in weather. And if we want to understand about long-term trends uh, and how extreme weather is changing, we need longer records. And those records could be, could be created. They do exist in many places around the world if we just took the time and effort to, to dig into our archives and, and find them. Um, but it's also true that um, that the many nations around the world have dug into their archives and digitized um, many observations, um, but they're not available to climate scientists openly for us to use. Many nations still have data behind paywalls. Um, and I think that's um, it's not helping us understand the changes to our climate and our weather. And I know the WMO has worked very hard on, on this aspect um, in the past. I think there's more to do. We need to ensure that the data that has been recovered, that is available, um, that can be used to make better decisions and inform our understanding is available for all of us. So I think that's a very important message that we that we need to remember. Thank you, Ed. Open data exchange, we are talking here about collaboration on the World Economic Forum side. Gim Huey, why is multi-stakeholder collaboration also so critical to support the resilience to extreme weather events? was uh, created uh, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, to look at public-private uh, collaboration to improve the state of the world, right? Um, so when uh, Brigitte sent me this question to talk about collaboration, 
the question that I actually asked myself was, can we collaborate and compete at the same time? Right. Uh, and my conclusion is if societies have to progress, right, uh, we have to compete and collaborate, right? There are two sides of the same coin. Because if you think about uh, the tragedy of the commons, right, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the stories behind it, it's, which is that if each of us seek to maximize individual gain, uh, it will eventually lead to the collapse of systems, right? Uh, and that is very much uh, the challenge that we're faced today. So if we want to safeguard the common good and to protect our public goods, whether this is fresh air, clean waters, right, uh, healthy soils, we will have to have a common set of rules within which competition happens, right? Uh, but if there are no rules and no guardrails, right, and, and each for all and whatever it takes, right, uh, we will all uh, be faced with the same dire consequences, which is the end of humanity, right? Um, so collaboration is a prerequisite uh, for competition. And likewise, competition uh, has to have a collaborative framework in, in place. The fact that today we are very much near or at the tipping points uh, across the planetary boundaries suggests that many of the rules today are probably in, inadequate or insufficient right, to cope with uh, our, our modern systems. And we need to review uh, many of these ways of working, whether it's uh, our models of production and consumption, our industrial agricultural systems, and to see what are the kinds of rules that we need to put in place to better enhance so that we can continue to have a, a safeguard our public commons. Um, I thought this collaboration is not just going to be between public and private sector, right? Uh, I think that is a very important nexus uh, because issues are complex and you need uh, market action as well as uh, public uh, uh, frameworks uh, to support uh, the process. But it also has to be one that's between global institutions and local communities and more importantly, across generations. So I'm very happy that the youth are actually seated uh, amongst us in this audience, right? Because this compact has to be one where we not just safeguard commons for today, but also one that can endure across generations and, and time. And this resilience muscle uh, requires us to invest into capabilities. It also requires organization. And today we are probably faced with one of the most challenging organization needs Given the challenge and the urgency of the climate crisis, uh, we need to go fast, but we also need to go far together, right? Uh, and how to make that happen, it requires uh, enormous amounts of trust, uh, organization, building bridges between public-private sectors across global, local communities, but also between generations. And, um, and here, uh, I really like the fact uh, or the comment made around raising the WMO voice, because part of uh, my role at the forum is to see how we can better connect the nexus between science, policy, and big business, and turbocharge that collaborative model so that, uh, that science can be very quickly translated to business insights, policy action, uh, and to provide that fact-based, very robust approach in which we can uh, co-create the future. So uh, very much welcome a collaboration in, uh, with the WMO and your partners to see how we can address uh, the climate uh, challenge and emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the future generations, they, they are counting on us somehow. Uh, Ed, the last question for you. What, what kind of tools, what kind of style of communication do you think future generations will expect to help them co-create or to help them collaborate or feeling empowered? So I think, you know, the, the, the two tools that we need are education and communications. You know, we need to ensure that people understand um, the risks uh, and the problems, um, because you know, in many places we are going to ask people to change in, in many ways if we are to tackle the climate crisis, uh, and they need to understand why they're being asked to make those changes. And so, education um, is important, and communication uh, will help the, that education in ensuring um, the youth, but also adults as well, understand um, the risks and the changes that, that are going on. And there are two enormous challenges that, that obviously we, we all face. We obviously have to reduce emissions um, to, to stabilize global temperatures. Many of the solutions uh, do exist already, but we need more solutions. Uh, and the younger generations will be the ones coming up with those novel solutions uh, in the future. Uh, and so that's really, really important. 
It's also not just um, the climate crisis we face. We have a biodiversity crisis uh, as well. Uh, and obviously there's are also critical issues around malnutrition, access to energy, access to water that we need to solve as well. And all of these are going to need novel solutions, um, particularly from, from today's youth to, uh, as, they, as they go forwards. We also need to uh, adapt to a warmer world. We need to ensure that we're planning for resilient communities to reduce our vulnerability to extreme weather when it, when it comes our way. Um, and as those extreme weather events get worse, we're going to need to improve our education and communication about those events in advance. We're going to need improved weather forecasts. We need to communicate those weather forecasts effectively and accurately and quickly to those who need to make the decisions um, to move out of the way or make other decisions about how to reduce the damage from those extreme weather events. Um, and especially in vulnerable countries, that's going to be really, really important. Um, and so those are the challenges that we will face. Um, and I'm sure the WMO in its next 150 years will be heavily involved in helping the next generation tackle those challenges. Thank you very much. The next generation is here. We have with us today two young people, Salika Amin and Maximilian Schneider. They are both uh, high school students from the Lycée International in Ferney Voltaire. Two months ago, they gathered um, young people from around the world, over 20 countries, for a big, one of the biggest Model United Nations conference. It was held partly here in WMO and also in this room. Let's have a look at the topics they covered during this conference with a short video. Trois jours, 500 élèves venus de 20 pays se sont réunis à Genève pour une COP jeune. Je suis chair du comité du Océan. Au cours des débats, la solution qui m'a paru la plus intéressante et innovante est la capture et stockage du carbone qui consiste à séparer le dioxyde de carbone des déchets industriels, puis l'isoler et le transporter en l'enfouissant sous terre par exemple. I'm the chair of the committee WMO. During these three days, we discussed how to provide the whole population with secure access to early warning systems for extreme weather events. The resolution which I liked the most was the one about how to use new technologies to encourage local communities to participate and also to raise awareness about extreme weather events. Soy presidente del Comité UN Habitat y una de las ideas que más me ha marcado durante esta conferencia ha sido la propuesta de la creación de una entidad que permita la comunicación científica entre países, tratada del Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange, también conocido como CAKE. I am chairing the UN Water Committee. Our focus is on helping vulnerable populations and ecosystems facing drought through establishing particular tariffs for households exceeding a certain threshold of water use. I am the chair of the Security Council. We discussed on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in which delegates proposed a resolution on which we could see equality between Israel and Palestine on access to water, but unfortunately China and Russia use their veto right. I am a chair at the Digital Committee, and one clause that particularly stuck to me was the creation of an international institution that would manage the afterlife of the smartphones and that would help the process of recycling. Je suis chair de la FAO, et une chose qui m'a plu le plus durant cette conférence est comment les délégués ont lutté contre la pêche illégale tout en finançant la pêche industrielle et en tenant compte des dérèglements climatiques. Nous, jeunes, avons fait notre part. Nous espérons que les instances internationales s'intéresseront à nos propositions et sauront s'appuyer sur notre enthousiasme. Maximilian and Salika, you were part of this uh, WMO committee that, that was discussing here, a very creative one. The floor is yours if you want to give us some detail. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General, distinguished ambassadors, honorable guests. Dear Mr. Tallis, first, I would like to thank you for welcoming us back into the WMO today. We were here two months ago for our 13th editions of our Model United Nations Conference. And it is with great pleasure that we come back to share with you this very inspiring experience. My name is Maximilian Schneider. 
I represented the United States in the WMO committee. Our committee was made up of 43 delegates representing 22 countries. We worked on two different issues. During the discussion of the first issue related to early warning systems, the delegations adopted a single resolution presented by Mexico, which took into consideration the interests of all. The delegations stressed the importance of advancing our knowledge in the fields of scientific research to better protect ourselves, as well as the need to develop infrastructure to protect the population from climate disasters. The committee also voted for more original solutions, such as the creation of a climate risk indicator according to the regions of the world to act in priority in the most affected areas or the sharing of meteorological data between all countries using the MP system. <clears throat> Sorry. Finally, they proposed the creation of a policy that sends a message to all phones to have a population alert service, which alerts all users of an upcoming new disaster. Salik and I represented the United States. We had proposed the extension of the Emping program, which is an application of the NOAA an American agency to the whole world. The Emping program collects weather reports from the public through a free available app for smartphones or mobile devices. The NSSL uses the data in a variety of ways, including to develop new radar and forecasting technologies and techniques. This application was still allows to better understand our environment, a key step to better warn people against these risks. We recently learned on March the 3rd that the United States put the application in free service to be used worldwide. We are happy to see that our ideas are getting something closer to feasible. I now hand it over to Salika, who is going to explain the proposed solutions for the second topic. Thank you. Distinguished guests, my name is Salika Amin, and I was representing the USA in the WMO committee during the three-day Ferment Conference at Geneva. I feel honored to present the synthesis of the solutions for the second issue, which is weather data collection. Why and how can we involve citizens? For this phase of the debate, two resolutions presented by Japan and Costa Rica were drafted. The ideas contained in them revolve a lot around awareness and call for citizen participation in the collection of meteorological data. But there were also other solutions, such as the creation of a common fund for financial support to help NGOs with citizen awareness and the creation of a global network in cooperation with citizen organizations to create projects to make weather data more available to all. The committee also noted the importance of cooperation between governments to help the most vulnerable countries with the least access to new technologies to, acqu to acquire this asset for the future and the prosperity of their people. As a result, a consensus was reached and many innovative ideas were reflected in the resolutions adopted by the committee. The first resolution proposes a global take on taking awareness and meteorological risks and data collection by various collective actions, mainly focusing on the value of government involvement. While the second resolution centralizes towards a more incremented vision of how nations can come together with NGOs, associations, and companies to augment and expand citizen science in the domain of weather data collection, and is targeted towards innovative ways in which the youth and communities can be engaged for a more inclusive and participatory approach. You can also read our final report with the resolutions adopted in our committee on our website, www.ferman.org. If I may conclude, both of the resolutions for the first and the second issue tries to communicate a simple idea that is, come together to reach a greater purpose because strength lies in unity. Coming together is a beginning, working together is progress and working together then also becomes success. We, the young people of today, hope for a future where citizens, politicians and governments can assemble and work together to build a world that is not only safe and well-equipped for extreme weather disasters, but also that is inclusive, stable, and hopeful. 
We, the youth of the present, are motivated to become the catalyst of positive change that safeguards our future and the future of generations to come. Finally, I would like to thank Mr. Tallis, Secretary General of the WMO, for giving us a chance to showcase our ideas and thoughts regarding extreme meteorological events and plans towards adaptation and mitigation. I also want to extend my gratitude towards the directors of Furman who gave us this memorable opportunity. To end, I would like to say that unity and hope go hand in hand and are the two most fundamental ingredients for change. Thank you for your time and listening. Thank you very much, Maximilian and uh, Salika. Very, very inspiring ideas. Um, I think, uh, Gim Hui, you have a question to Salika and Maximilian. If I may, um, what gives you hope for the future? What are you most excited or optimistic about? So what I personally believe uh, gives us hope for a hopeful future is because we believe in unity. We believe that we can come together, you know, citizens, youth, politicians and governments, we can work together and come in unity. And we have hope that when we come together, we can come up with solutions. And we also hope that the youth of today are as motivated as we say they are and are as ambitious as we say they are when, they, when it comes to climate change and have innovative uh, ideas and solutions and how we can tackle the losing war that we're currently losing for the climate change. So the one thing that gives us hope is the youth. The youth are the hope for the future. And uh, we believe that change comes when everyone comes together in unity and hope that a sustainable future awaits us. That's a beautiful answer. And I think, uh, Ed, you also have a question for these two young people. Yeah, no, that was, was wonderful to hear um, about those about the conference and, and the ideas that came out of it. It's very inspiring. So I mean, my question would be, what would you ask the climate scientists um, like myself and the many thousands of others around the world, what is the most important aspects that you need to know? Where should we be focusing our efforts uh, over the next decade or so? I think, uh, as I hope everyone agrees, that science is a key step to better understand our world, as we've stressed in our resolutions. And um, we think that we should try to uh, better understand, it's easy to say, the less understanded areas, but um, we have to, uh, we have to learn that uh, new subjects in different areas. And I think we have to hear sight we have to listen to science be, and policymakers and everyone should listen to science to get to a better future. Be, it, they should listen to climate change because at this rate, we think that we're running into a wall and we don't, um, we need to continue our effort in understanding climate and uh, weather events to better prevent and protect citizens against these uh, extreme uh, events that are uh, difficult to predict, predict in a long-term uh, e event. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we, as we still have a little bit of time, uh, we have sitting with us today, uh, Secretary General Emeritus Michel Jarreau, and he may have a perspective about what he just heard. And maybe you may have a question for these young people here, because we are talking about generations, right? Yeah, actually, thank you. I, I do have a question for you. <laughs> because 
When we talk about climate change, one of the big issue is this uh, different perception of time scales. Uh, what is the time horizon? Uh, uh, what the biz even in the business field, uh, some business will be interested in by short term decisions. Some others are looking more long term. And as a young generation, you have a different perspective on this time horizon. Now, the theme of this year is the future of weather, climate and water across generation. And many of you mention the importance of science, of scientific information to inform decision making, take, being taken into account not only by business, by decision makers, by everyone. Now, one of the challenges we have is that in many, many countries, it's getting more and more difficult to attract young people to study science. Even more so, by the way, for young girls. So as young people, would you have a recommendation for us, for the older generation, what to do to be able to attract more young people to scientific studies? Mm. I think we should try to involve as you said, the use as much as possible. And uh, this needs to be done in actions such as we did with Famun. It involved us in different aspects. We learn more about different topics uh, such as climate change and the issues that go with it in different areas of the world. Uh, I think, uh, in actions like these, we learn more, uh, not only not only on ourselves, but on our, on the world, and learn what our interest path are. Um, and I think, in such ways, we should try and uh, go further, uh, not only with us, but to every person and every young person try to reach out to them through uh, uh, conferences for the youth so that they know how uh, the future is going to be and to know how to shape the future. And just to add on to what Max just said, I think it's really interesting how you said education, especially girls' education. I think education is really the key route, and it really is a grassroots in how uh, children perceive a lot of uh, world issues. So I think integrating, um, you know, things like uh, edu educational uh, education on weather, weather science, um, weather data collection is very, very important in kind of harnessing this um, this knowledge and. Uh, this knowledge about weather data and this interest about weather data and the climate for the future. So definitely educational integration is very important. Like Max said, having a participatory and integrative program such as Furman that allows children to participate and have a voice uh, in the climate change and come up with creative solutions and resolutions towards the most pressing world issues. But also I believe social media and technology, like we talked about, is very, very important. And I think if we use uh, such a strong base, such as social media, I think it can attract a lot of attention and use it properly and have a social media platform that is truly authentic, especially when it comes to weather data collection or climate change. And lastly, I think is making sure and letting these children and the youth of today believe that their voices are being heard. Because one of the the, the the problems is the youth don't believe that their voices are being heard and whatever the solutions that they're creating, the ideas that they have are not be, being implemented. So yes, so these are my idea, educational integration, social media and letting our voices be heard. Thank you. Maybe Ed Hawkins, you may have an idea as well or a question for, for these young people on um, or a suggestion on how to, make them interested in, in science and climate science. You're working in a university, you're a professor. What is your feeling with the evolution of education over time? Well, I mean, it's just a fascinating science to be part of. Um, uh, and um, we, we see the weather every day. Um, and so no, I would you know, encourage people to, to, to get involved um, in the science, learn um, you know, the basic physics and math that is needed. 
um, uh, to to understand our weather. I, I don't have a particular question, but I, I certainly agree that education um, is, is going to be absolutely vital in, in making the next steps. Thank you very much. Professor Talas, you have a suggestion for the young people so they get interested in climate science and they, they grab this education uh, path. Yes, so, so uh, in, in science, uh, you can be part of uh, solving the main problems that uh, we are having on this planet. And, uh, and my own experience as a former scientist and a professor is that it's really fascinating and when I started my career as a scientist, uh, for the first two years, I felt guilty because uh, they were paying me salary because it was so such a great fun to be a scientist. So, so, so uh, I would like to recommend you to take that risk and uh, become a scientist, and uh, and 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 you can you can work for the public good, and uh, and 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 it's also fascinating. And this uh, science community, especially this atmospheric science community, where we are in. Is, is a really nice community. It's a, it's a family, and um, and it's 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 a family worldwide, and uh, that's also a special special dimension of, of that. So I very much encourage you to consider becoming scientist or even atmospheric scientist in the future. Thank you very much. Any person in the room who would like to ask a question to one of our speakers or to the Fermin representatives? No one in the room. Okay, so it will be time to wrap up now. Um, thank you very much for this inspiring discussion. Uh, I have the pleasure to give the floor again to Professor Talas for his concluding remarks and to conclude this ceremony. So first of all, I would like to thank all of the all of the speakers here. I think that we had an excellent pro program. That, thanks to your your input and um, and and. Uh, and, and especially this youth dimension was uh, was very interesting and, and and good one for this uh, this day and uh, and uh, of course you as uh, young people we are very much uh, talking about your future and the future of your your children and your grandchildren here and um, and and and, and uh, personally I'm, I've been very encouraged to see the behavior and thinking of the young people I have also five children and I have been learning many things uh, from from them, besides my wife, of course, and um, and and, uh, and 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 uh, and and I think that you can also teach your your parents and us uh, older generations how to how to behave. And we we just had this COVID uh, pandemic, which was uh, limiting our everyday life uh, a lot, uh, uh, locally and also globally, and uh, and and to be successful in climate. Uh, mitigation in solving this problem, we would uh, need to change our everyday life only a bit. So how we produce energy, what kind of means we, we use for transportation, what kind of uh, food we eat and, uh, and what kind of uh, goods we buy, how the goods are produced, if they are produced uh, by using fossil energy. Of course, they are not very climate friendly, but all in all, I think that with fairly small changes in our everyday life uh, as compared to this COVID pandemic uh, changes we could uh, we could solve this problem and uh, and 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 the IPCC was uh, established here in Geneva in 1979 44 years ago and it was quite desperate to to write these reports after reports and and there was no no action but uh, what is very encouraging is that during the past uh, Ten years uh, first first the governments have been waking up and uh, once we listen to the speeches in new york for example uh, at the united nations uh, general assembly all of the heads of state practically talk about uh, uh, climate uh, issues as, as very high high priority and what is uh, even more encouraging is that the private sector has started uh, acting and uh, and players like world economic forum and uh, and their participants uh, are also eager to be part of the part of the solution and the most recent ipcc reports were showing that uh, the prices of uh, of uh, for example solar and wind energy they have been dropping under the prices of fossil fossil energy and that's thanks to 
technological development, uh, we are getting more and more affordable electric uh, vehicles on the market. Uh, and in all sectors, there's development uh, going on. Of course, we have to speed up the, the, the our mitigation efforts and uh, and what was achieved in, in some sake uh, uh, in, in adaptation especially was very encouraging and we will see some of the fruits of uh, of, of, of uh, some sake cop uh, in new york next week when we discuss the water water issues which is of course very close to the heart of uh, many of our members including egypt uh, where, where 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 water is a very critical critical element uh, even life and death and we have we have very also very high hopes concerning the cop 28 uh, which you are happy to host in in dubai in late uh, november early december and uh, the discussions that i have had with uh, dr al zaber and, uh, and and his uh, his team it's very encouraging and i have learned that also secretary general guterres is very optimistic that we will see great progress in mitigation and uh, and also adaptation uh, in, in 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 dubai so thanks for the, all, all the work that your government has done for for that sake already and then i would like to thank um, michael for 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 this historical uh, review and sometimes it's a little bit depressive to see that the things that they were thinking 150 years ago they are still actual we think that they are totally new things but uh, but uh, but unfortunately somebody else has had the wisdom already 150 50 years ago and of course we are grateful for the government of austria for hosting this uh, first uh, first meeting where, where imo and wmo uh, was established and of course that has been a great great uh, success story and 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 world economic forum you play a very important role and it's important that you echo these issues in among the private sector companies and uh, economic community and uh, and 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 to, if you are able to talk about these things in economic terms, I think it makes our case much uh, stronger. And that's that's what's happening. As as you said, uh, it's uh, at least five times cheaper to to mitigate and li to live with the consequences. And of course, uh, that's our our challenge. And thanks for the for for the youth and and thanks for these nice uh, nice conferences that you organized here here a couple of months ago. And it was enc very encouraging that we. We are getting new generation of uh, wise decision makers, uh, even these global decision makers, because of your your efforts. But with these words, thanks for the opportunity to, to address you, and thanks for coming here. And uh, and I'm very proud of the of the high quality of the staff of WMO. But uh, upstairs, you you can see that besides being high experts in weather, water, and climate issues, uh, they are also very good in gastronomy. We, we will offer you uh, food from our six regions and uh, and and i'm sure that there will be some proud uh, uh, proud uh, chefs upstairs who, who will serve you food from their home home countries uh, i hope that you will have a chance to enjoy also that part of the of the world meteorological uh, day thank you